All right, <clears throat> we're live in the green room. And today, uh, in the interview series for the community by the community, we're here with, I know it's Kier, but I want to say Seer because of the way you spell it on Facebook. But anyway, I'll endeavor to call you Kier O'Tierney from House Savers, owner operator. So uh, introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm Kia from Allsabers. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, uh, and you probably don't because Australia is, you know, all the way down there and no one really knows that we're around. Um, we're, we're just a very small uh, company that's just kind of trying to make our own way, do our own thing and just be a bit different. And I've been doing this for a bit over four years now. Four years. So 2017? Yeah, thereabouts, yeah. Okay. Nice. I remember when I got into the community, <clears throat> there was only like a handful, which would have been, I want to say 2015, 16. Mm. Uh, there was the Sons of Obi-Wan group and just like a, a small handful of members hailing from Australia. So it was certainly nice to see see your, your name and your brand kind of, you know, come up through the, the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me, what's it like to, well, first off, let's establish, okay, so it's well known that uh, you're a vendor for LGT, correct? Yeah, that's right. So um, we are, uh, they, they have different classifications for vendors, um, you know, based on, uh, I suppose, the, the the level at which we work with them and 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 how official we are and, and we're you know pretty much about as official as it gets um and i think there are well, i couldn't even tell you how many there are around the world but in australia like you say there's not many people in savers here so yeah we we are definitely an lgt vendor but um it's it, it's it's a, a term that i don't like because the connotations have always been oh yeah but you know you're, you're selling somebody else's catalog and yes we are selling a catalog from an oem manufacturer but we are also making a lot of our own stuff and that is something i think that puts us in a, a bit of a unique position as far as lgt is concerned there aren't many vendors around the world that are uh, building up the range uh their own independent separate exclusive range which is something that we've been focused on for some time here okay and we'll circle back to uh the lgt uh, <clears throat> pardon me LGT connection in a bit. Um, for the viewers, what inspired you, um, viewers and fans, I guess, followers of your page? If I may, what inspired you to um, get into designing and 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 uh, producing sabers? Um, I think it, it was a bit of a, a segue from the whole reason that Old Sabres came to be. So, you know, Old Sabres was born out of the idea that Australia is a reasonably isolated country. Uh, and when it comes to things like Sabres, it, it's a niche market, um, which is 90% run out of the United States. And, and it, getting anything shipped out of the US to here is, is wretchedly expensive. That's how Old Sabres came to be. Um, the recognition that there was a need for something more local. But the next step for that was um, doing something distinctive, because as the uh, population within the saber industry within the saber industry has grown, there are a lot of people uh, popping up and selling the same you know LGT stuff, and and you know we we have that in Australia. There are a couple uh, of people that have started here recently that are selling the same stuff, but even before that was a, a factor, we've always kind of wanted to do you know, our own thing. Uh, there are a lot of savers out there, but we, we still feel that there's going to be room for creativity and, and, and doing our own thing. Uh, so we've already released two uh, models of our own, and we've got two more in the pipeline right now that are um, going to be getting released fairly soon. And then thereafter, there's about another six. So we, uh, we really just want to build up our own range so we can stand out from the pack. Okay. Um, Circling back to um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, I guess, polarizing um, topics in the groups in the community would be Asian manufacturing. And we can say China, but I mean, everybody knows, let's be honest, everyone knows. Um, <clears throat> so for the cost to manufacture in America, and I'm not commenting for good or ill, 
Um, just because from your point of view, it is a smart business decision on your part to have manufacturing done uh, where it's mo most cost effective. So there, there are companies in the US, um, and we're not going to name names, we forget about the, the top two, um, we won't even mention them, but uh, <clears throat> from other companies that have stuff manufactured in Asia. Hmm. So can you speak to, I guess, the negative connotations of ha having things manufactured in China and also your involvement and so now we circle back to your your involvement or your experience with lgt yeah look um the manufacturing in china thing i've, I've always found it a bit funny because um th there is so little in electronics you know if you just think of the components of it the there are so few things that are manufactured anywhere else so re regardless of, of where the hilt itself is made, I, I don't think it would be possible for uh, many hilt manufacturers and many saber manufacturers to get away from China altogether. Uh, from a, a business standpoint, from a, an operational standpoint, we have looked at getting things manufactured locally. And we have uh, ascertained that for such a niche product in such a niche market with such a small amount of clientele, relatively speaking, um all we would end up doing is alienating our customers the, the whole reason we started was to make things accessible here you know australia like i said is isolated uh relatively speaking things are expensive to get into the country um i don't think that there would be enough market for us here to be manufacturing locally there are people that are trying uh in fairness in, in savers and there is actually another guy fairly local to here who makes his own but it's not a manufacturing line he just makes them as needed and his prices unexpectedly are, are high as they should be because the skill uh, for a machinist to be able to apply his or her trade is is worth a lot of money in my opinion um, i've just actually had uh, a local machinist uh, knurl uh, 12 of our steel incendius for us um, and we're going to be doing something special with those and the cost to do that was very high as it should be um, if i were to have them made new in china um uh, it would you know for the price that i paid for 12 i probably could have gotten over 100 done and from a business point of view it makes sense the the the, the drawback i suppose um for, for china is, is uh, translation sometimes especially when we're talking about designs so if, if i do a new design uh, i have an, an account manager as who i work with very closely she speaks english really well but the engineer that I work with doesn't speak English at all. So I have to be able to um, do a 3D drawing. Um, I have to write as many notes on that as possible, give it to my sales manageress, who will then talk to the engineer. And there's sort of this, you know, she, she becomes the middle person in this conversation. And she's very good at translating it all, but it obviously kills the efficiency of the process slightly. And, uh, you know, we have had things lost in translation before, which of course is an issue. Uh, but from a quality control point of view, uh, you know, you're always going to get quality issues with mass manufacturing anywhere. And, and I, I reject the notion that you can avoid that in any market, um, whether it's made in the States, Australia, China, Japan, mass manufacturing, anything, you are always going to have a rate of failure. Um, I'm pretty happy to say that LGT, uh, you know, for, for their bumps in the road have been improving. Uh, you know, we have had the occasional problem here and there, but um, they, they're always willing to talk about it and always willing to come to a solution. Um, and, and to give you one good example, when the Incendius was made, that was our first uh, uh, unique design. The steel version of that had to be remade a couple of times because the factory had erred uh, on the internal bore. Um, they'd also erred on the outside finish, so we had to get it sent back and redone. But, but LGT were happy to accommodate that because ultimately, as a client of them, I paid for a service and the service had to be done to a certain standard. So uh, that was not a problem at all. Um, what was the second part to your question? Sorry, it's still very early, so I'm <laughs> not quite well, awake. Yes. yes, and by the way, thank you very much for, like this is for our viewers in North America, which uh, we are currently recording or going, we're live, uh, Eastern Standard Time for for Kier. I did it. Uh, he woke up like ungodly early. I think it was 4.30 or 5 o'clock. <laughs> it's 5 30 now but you have been up since 4 30. <laughs> yeah, to uh hop on with this um i guess the gist of of the second half of the question is um 
there is drama that arises in the groups because, uh, and I, I know a couple of North American vendors and <clears throat> I'm actually going to point the finger at one manufacturer is, uh, uh, whoopsie Victor, I think manufacturing, mm. uh, which a couple of North American, um, individuals went live with sabers and runs. Um, and all of a sudden boop, it popped up on whoopsie Victor's website prototypes were like, you know, pre final iterations of the, of the saber went live and were available at like yeah. half the cost that, yeah shot up to the same price you know as as the uh, run saver was available for in america mm -hmm. so i guess the uh recasting would be what i'm getting at because yeah. i know that you're very careful as well that because you design your own you come out with your own models um you're very careful to uh, not kind of infringe on someone else's ip and you know, yeah, so, yeah, 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 and, and you know we're very careful not to, and you know it, it's difficult because there are only so many ways you can make a tube. You know, really, if you break it down, there are only so many ways. And you know, when Incendius came out, um, and you've seen Incendius, haven't you? You, you know what I'm talking about yeah. when, I, when I say Incendius. Um, I was contacted by another manufacturer who asked if, by chance, that design had come from LGT, and this particular seller was somebody who had worked with LGT before, and they were concerned that maybe they had given me that design off the back of one of their designs. They then showed me a very vaguely similarly shaped saber without the venting holes and everything in the front of it. And I'm like, oh, I've never even seen that before in my life. And no, LGT didn't give me that design. That was me uh, doing my first 3D sketching work ever and failing 26 times to make the incendious and then settling on version 27, which is what got manufactured. Um, we haven't had a problem with LGT recasting any of our stuff. And, and to be fair, I, I trust uh, Damien, the CEO, I trust him uh, you know, to look after our business in China. And he's, he's, he's never not done that. You know, he's always looked after our, our interests um, all the way from the point of uh, conceptual design uh, up to after sales service and everything in between. So I, I have no concerns about that. And it's an interesting point that the only people who have ever raised that concern with me directly have a different horse in the race. So, you know, you, you got to kind of take it all with a pinch of salt, I think, when you've got people that are direct competitors to not only yourself, but also the people that you work with in China saying, oh, you know, don't trust them because of X, Y, Z thing. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, but, you know, you're in opposition to these people. I mean, you're going to say anything to try to discredit what they do. That's, that's you know, well, I was going to say that that's business, but ultimately, to be honest, that's bad business. You know, I, I think one of the biggest problems I see in this industry, and it's not just in this industry, but it is so painfully obvious in a niche industry, is this propensity for companies to try to pull other companies down or individuals to try and pull other individuals down, um, as opposed to them uh, looking inward and, and building up their own product and their own brand and, and improving what they do. You know, ultimately, Oddsabers is going to succeed or fail off the back of what Oddsabers does, not off, the back, not off the back of us, you know, talking ill of another company. Um, you know, so it's 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 one of those things that really irritates me in the industry. It's it's gotten quite bad, um, and that is born off the back of any particular side of any particular fence that a company wants to sit on. It's like, oh, we make our stuff here, and you guys make your stuff there, and you know, it, it's the whole red versus blue kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I I don't buy into it. I tend to ignore it. Um, I just put my head down, work as hard as I can, and and you know, um, sort of how, how hard I do have to work. Uh, I, I just think, you know, that the negativity that comes out of this, um, you know, sort of constant backbiting that goes on in the industry, it's, it's never going to give you anything positive as a business owner. It's best just to stay away from it and just put your head down do your own thing, do it well. If you're doing the job well, you know, if you're making good products, your products are going to speak for themselves. It doesn't matter what the opposition are doing. It doesn't matter what your competition are doing. And they can have as many problems with you as they like, but ultimately just don't reciprocate, you know, leave them be, let them do their negative crap and just stick, just stay the course and stick to what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's funny. Um, <clears throat> I have some parts I was fooling around with earlier and I, I saw a uh, post in one of the groups where someone was um, hailing the, the quality of machining from arguably the one of the biggest manufacturers in North America, the quality of the machining being so great. 
and I was working with a couple of pieces, which um, I won't name names, but the quality of the machining is the same. Uh, you never know the difference, and and arguably the same uh, <clears throat> uh, same parts, really. But uh, anyhow, you segue uh, there. You mentioned about uh, how how much you work and how long you work. Um, one of the things that uh, I think people should consider is the fact that this is not a full time gig for you. This is something that uh, you you hold down a full time job and have family and have to run Oz Savers and uh, design and oversee everything that goes on with the uh, with the hilts and the runs. Yeah. So right. speak to that. Speak to that if you would. Um, this is probably the biggest negative about it all, really. I mean, I, I love this. I love what I do. I love Savers. I love Star Wars. Um, I've grown up with it, and it's had a huge impact on my life. Huge. Um, but... You know, I, I, I'm not at a point where all savers is, and I don't know if we'll ever get to a point where all savers is going to be something I can live off. Um, I do have to work uh, 40, upwards of 40 hours a week um, with a full time job. I work in a corporate affairs position, um, a lot of travel. Um, then I do probably an extra, you know, between 20 and 40 hours a week uh, with Oz Savers stuff. And, and with that, that's, you know, operational things, design work, um, taking care of logistics, repairs, returns, the whole lot. So, you know, some weeks, um, 60, 70, 80 hours of, of actual work, um, if that makes sense. And yeah, it, it does get hard. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate that our customers are um, probably the best customers that we could ever hope for. They're really patient. Um, you know, I've had to explain to them a couple of times. Yeah, look, I'm I'm sorry, I'm really behind. You know, uh, getting you know something done, whether it's uh, putting a, an instructional video up or something like that. And everyone's always been really cool about it. You know, I've never had anybody kind of say, "Oh yeah, but you know, you said you'd get this done, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. You know, people here are pretty cruisy. Um, you know, this week was a, a bit of a disjointed week. Um, I had to travel for work. Uh, middle of the week, I had to take my my wife into the the nearest capital city to us, which is about an hour away. Um, she goes in every six months for a treatment in hospital, um, and you know it's it's days like that when you're sort of on the road and traveling so much, and you can't really do much when you're driving. You know, I can't be sitting there doing CAD work while I'm driving a car. Um, those kind of days sort of really, you know, it, it, it does kind of put a lot of strain on. But um, you know, I, I I love this enough that it's worth doing. And it's my hope that maybe one day, you know, Wild Savers can build into something a bit bigger than what it is now. Uh, you know, maybe something very different to what it is now. And uh, you know, we 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 may uh, find ourselves in the position uh, my, that that being, you know, myself and my family, where we can, you know, arguably and safely say, all right, full time job no longer required. Might be able to go part time and and do a bit more focus on this. Uh, but you know, it's. Yeah, some some weeks are hard. I'll be honest. There there have been some weeks that have been extraordinarily difficult, uh, but you know, I I enjoy it enough that it's it's worth that. Nice. Um, <clears throat> now you and I are friends on social media, uh, so I'm aware of some things that um, your followers and and customers might not be aware of. Uh, one of which being the uh, restoration that you're undertaking right now, which spurs me to ask, is there, <clears throat> is there a part of the process between designing, um, designing through to having an installed saber that you wish you could kind of be more hands-on or, or take a larger part of? Yeah, um, so the, the process as it is now is, um, just to walk you through step by step how it goes for us. Uh, I sketch a design, sometimes on paper, sometimes in CAD. It just depends on how complex that design is going to look. Um, from there, it's usually 3D printed, which I do here. I've got my 3D printer here. Um, and then any tweaks are made. Thereafter, uh, I speak to the engineer at LGT and get a quotation and, and, and get a prototype made. And we have to pay quite a large amount of money uh, to get a prototype made. And uh, I suppose, and thereafter it's manufactured in, in quantity, I suppose for me being able to prototype locally would be good. Um, it's about the only thing that I 
wish I could do, and, and, and not for a cost saving at all, because for me to own a CNC machine and, and operate a CNC machine would be extraordinarily expensive. Um, but that time frame of being able to prototype things and more so be able to make an adjustment on things quite quickly, that would be highly beneficial to us. And, and the case in point, um, you would have seen the uh, Apprentice V2 that we just did a, an announcement on last week. And there is a very, very slight adjustment that needs to be made to that. And it's not a big adjustment. We're literally talking offsetting a couple of things by three millimeters. Um, that's going to probably take about three or four weeks to remake a prototype for. Then the prototype comes to me that's about a week. Then we can give it a look over and say, yep, approve the manufacturing. And then it's probably another three to four weeks after that before we start seeing the first come off the production line. So, you know, we're, we're talking an eight week differential between prototype and potentially having a manufactured product out. And we had this with the Wanderer as well. The Wanderer um, was uh, the initial prototype was missing uh, one of the symbols that we engraved around the, the emitter. Uh, although it was on the CAD design, for whatever reason, the cam work completely missed it. Uh, and then the second and third prototypes, it was a color issue. It was trying to get that color right. And uh, in fact, uh, I, I don't have it near me, but I could show you the original color was like a rose gold. Um, which actually some people have said that they really loved, but it you know just wasn't really what we were looking for. So that that put the wanderer back by a couple of months. Um, so being able to do uh, prototyping here would be extraordinary. If I could do that, um, that would that would just save us weeks and weeks of of process, even with the setup time for a CNC machine, which may be several hours. Um, it would be worth taking those several hours in my day to do it just so that we could shave weeks off potential prototyping time. But it's also a cost thing. You know, a CNC machine is going to set us back, you know, for a four axis, five axis machine like that, we're looking between thirty and fifty thousand uh, dollars, probably closer to fifty by the time you incorporate tooling. Um, we're just not a big enough company. You know, ultimately we we aren't turning over the kind of money to justify that. You have to get uh SP props and collectibles up, get his equipment up and running and just make him do that stuff. <laughs> well, Sean, Sean yeah. and I talk a lot, actually. He's, and, and, and we have, we yeah. have discussed the incident before. <laughs> he has to buy you lunch now because I name dropped him. <laughs> He's not going to buy me anything. But for what it's worth, Sean and I don't live close to each other. He lives um, a good deal further north. Uh, than I do. So if you look at a map of Australia, for anybody who's who's out of Australia, we're on the east coast. Um, we're in a little town uh, my, myself. That is um, uh, Rosewood in Queensland, and uh, Sean is is way up north somewhere. He's like a he's, he's like a thousand k's north or something from me. Hey, um, I'm from Canada. I'm allowed to make that assumption. Just down uh, the road, yeah. a thousand kilometers. Well, it, and funnily enough, in Australia, we kind of do the same thing. It's like, ah, oh, it's just up the road, and you know, it could be could be about five hours worth of driving. But yeah, I'm 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 not going to go driving to see him anytime soon. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But you know, we we do talk a lot. We we talk a lot on social, um, probably every day. Um, and he is um, one of those guys in Australia. Um, if if I can just mention him briefly, who is again doing you know something very unique, and and, and that being that he, he's making. It, hilts that are well known canon extended universe whatever it happens to be but he's making them really well you know we we don't do accuracy at all sabers you know we're, we're not about accurate hilts we're about original designs for the most part and when we have done something you know like the wanderer which was inspired by malakos we have kept to the general shape of it but we've kind of taken our own spin a little bit yeah. and um that's something that that we do here where sean will you know, measure everything down to the most minute detail uh, and get it as accurate as he can. So um, it's probably one of the reasons that we get along so well because we are doing very different things, but in that same um, sphere. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that that we we kind of recognise that each other has a very different strength, and and it's it's good to be able to see that in one another, and yeah, you know, potentially maybe even do some work together at some point as well. Yeah, yeah. No, and that's good. That's good. Um, all right. We were talking about something last week, actually, for for anyone watching or follow-up viewers. We were supposed to try and uh, do this last weekend, um, and for kind of a special reason. But uh, here being in Australia and the time difference and whatnot, there were just some things that didn't line up. It didn't happen, so we're here now. And what do you got for us? All right, so you're... 
we're very lucky because you're going to be the first person to see this and, and publicly this is going to be the first time that this is ever seen. So we've been working on a couple of hills. So the Apprentice V2, everyone's seen um, that that uh, prototype, which we which we showed off about a week ago. But the, the other one's the Electris and the Electris has been um, being worked on at the same time uh, as the Apprentice. And this is the first time we've ever done two hilt releases at the same time or two hilt designs and prototyping and all of that process at the same time. I strongly recommend to anybody in the industry that's considering doing multiple hilts uh, at the same time, don't. It's really, really hard to manage. Um, what little time I have in life is is now gone uh, as a result of how intense this, this process is. But um, this is our first original design in a thin neck. Um, let's see if I can frame that properly. So now this is um, very, very close to what's going to get released. Um, there will be a slightly longer uh, pommel. Uh, we've found that that just needs to be extended ever so slightly, but for the most part, what you see here is what it's going to be. Um, dude, dude, that is beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and, and you know, when I when I first sketched this one, this was actually a surprisingly easy one to sketch. It wasn't as hard as uh, some of them. Um, when I first sketched this, I was I, I had some real misgivings about the neck, but you know, I'd been thinking about doing a thin neck for a while, and this didn't actually appear. Um, in the original sketch that I did versus the the um, the 3D design that we ended up getting done at the factory, there was a slight difference to the neck, and I, I didn't think that I'd like this quite so much. But when it's arrived, um, I've actually looked at that and said, you know what, I don't think I need to change it. Um, so this is essentially what the electrus is going to be, and we've we've done all of this from the ground up, um, including the thumb screw here, which was made. Um, we wanted. I don't know if you can really see it because the way my lighting's flaring it out, but there's a a, a bit of a, a taper in there as well, so that is um, that is something that, that that we've done specifically for this. The emitter is unique. Thin next is pretty standard. Uh, the control box, and um, I just want to talk about the control box a little bit because uh, right, uh, yeah. <laughs> Enter Tyler. Yeah, so um, so so Tyler, who runs Biosavers, and I are very good friends, and um, we've been talking for a long time um about various bits and pieces that we feel might be missing from the saber industry and for, for anybody who doesn't know tyler uh, and, and doesn't know what via sabers do their business model is built more around parts so you can assemble your own saber uh, using the variable hilt component system that lgt have released so where i sell primarily built finished complete hilts tyler uh, will um, set up a, a system whereby you can you know buy a grip buy a pommel buy an emitter you know and put it all together and, and Pretty much you know have, have your own custom saber but one of the things that's been missing from that is the control box and and uh very late last year we we had initial discussions about a modular system for a control box now um tyler is a really really nice guy and he's got some great ideas but what he can't do is the cad design work um so this is why he came to me because i can do that um and he you know we, we we'd spoken about it and he said you know is this something that would be viable and so I said, right, well, I'll give it a go and see what I can come up with. And, and in January, I think it was, um, I managed to uh, build the concept, 3D print it, um, and actually have it workable. Fast forward to about a month ago, and we got our um, prototype box in, uh, which I've got here, or one of them. Um, mm. So the prototype box, as a proof of concept, aluminium machined, uh, came through, and this... Uh, the idea of this is that you could buy any bhc based hilt from lgt whether you get it from buyer or us or you know, anybody else and this would just screw onto it and it's got a plunger inside that will engage the switch where it normally sits in the hilt so this is being adjusted now the the height of it was not quite right that's being adjusted mm -hmm. now but at the same time that all of that was going on i thought to myself well, why don't i integrate that into a hilt and so this has that control box on there um and this is a very low profile control box it's not very high at all so when we when we have these made at the factory we're going to have to offset that switch a little bit lower um so that that plunger isn't always engaging it so yeah that's um that's that's kind of ended up being born of that idea that tyler and i had together and i should point out because uh tyler sent me one of his helps <clears throat> i think it has the uh i want to say eco rgb or something it's a in help um mm -hmm. And that is a fantastic feeder saber. But for people that don't know, with uh, the VHC components, basically there's a LGT core, <clears throat> which is um, slide in, slide out, 
which Johnny's got something coming down the pipe, hopefully. Uh, I've been working with him on, and I'm super excited for that. Um, but as far as the updated course, um, but you have your, your pommel, your grip, the main section, which locks the, uh, the core and the main switch at 12 millimeter, I believe. Um, so I'm assuming, and then, sorry, and, and then the, uh, the top end, the emitter. I'm assuming that that control box matches the, uh, the, the uh, two set screws and the 12 millimeter on the core, right? That's yeah. right. So, um, the, uh, the inside, um, radius matches the diameter of the switch segments, uh, which is, uh, 33 mil. Um, the <coughs> holes line up for the screws, uh, to go in on either side. Um, and, uh, there's a plunger, which is the silver part there. That's the plunger switch, so that just engages with the switch. Um, this is going to be oh, lost one of the screws out of it. Um, this is going to be adjusted slightly because uh, we wanted this to be functional in, in every respect. So we wanted you to be able to use the saber um, as opposed to just being a decoration. And uh, we also wanted you to be able to charge the saber without having to remove it. So very importantly, there's a hole there. Um, and in fact, in a, a working uh, Electrus. So I don't know if that's going to come up. You could probably just oh. yeah. So the charger is there, and you can literally just put the charging cable straight in there. So you don't need to remove that box at all. Right. I forgot um, about the uh, charge port. Yeah. So that is. So that is. Um, that that was out of the idea that yeah we want to do this control box, but we don't just want it to be decorative. And there are people out there that make decorative boxes. Uh, there's people three D printing them now and everything, which is fine. Uh, but we, we wanted to do something sort of beyond that. We, we, we wanted the functionality uh, to be able to function, uh, to be able to operate the button uh, completely, and then also to be able to just slide that card out and charge it without any hassle. Now, to make this slightly more complicated, LGT are moving a lot of their things across from a round 2.1 mil recharge port to a USB-C. Um, and this is the reason why Tyler and I uh, work so well together. When we both got these prototypes in, so I got prototypes sent here, he got prototypes sent to him in Indiana. Um, we ascertained that we, we had four different prototypes originally, um, you know, two of them that would take the round plug, two of them that would take the USB-C, and we had to adjust uh, it. So we, we kind of wanted to bring that that um, manufactured uh, uh, quantity down a little bit. Uh, so rather than having four options, we just really wanted to bring it down to one. Uh, and that one option has ended up being um, a flat bottom rather than having these sort of two legs on there that fit into lots. Um, and uh, we're also going to have the uh, a recharge port hole that suits USB-C and a 2.1 mil. So regardless of what kind of saber you've got, if it's a VHC saber, mm -hmm. it's not fitted. Um, the only exception would be some of the newer ones that don't have those holes on the top where the button is. Uh, so things like Incendius, for instance, where you've got um, no uh, switch holes. Uh, sorry, you've got no screw holes on the inside of the switch. There's actually a screw in the back that pushes that switch segment forward. Um, and that's about the only time that these boxes won't suit. But there again, if you had a saber like that, you could then very easily talk to Tyler and pick yourself up a new switch module, um, which has those holes in, uh, and just replace your existing one. So it's still it's still modular pretty much for anybody that's got a VHD hill. You just might need to buy that tube as well if you've got one that doesn't have that um, that capacity. Nice. Hmm. Nice. All right. Well, I know you've got a busy day with your eighty hours a week. So uh, <laughs> today, today, today is family day. Actually, today I you know I still find time for my family. So today is oh. out with kids. yeah it's Saturday here. Sorry, it's Friday there. So um, it's Saturday morning. So I'm I'm thinking about going for a drive in the country, uh, taking my kids out. Um, you know, I'll I'll still be getting messages for the business, and I'll still be answering those when I'm when I'm not driving. Um, okay. But no, today, today is is going to be a slightly quieter day. I've, I've done a lot this week already, and I think my kids need some time with their dad. So, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, in closing, is there anything you want to say, or is there? Um, yeah, look, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to to talk to me this morning as well. Um, I really appreciate that. And yeah, look, you and I are good friends outside of all of this, but it's nice to be able to do the the businessy thing as well. Um, the, only, the only thing I would say is, uh, you know, for, for those of you that are not in Australia, um, we're very conscious of the fact that some of the designs that we're releasing, you guys are keen on. 
And we have worked with people overseas to ensure that our stuff does get over there. And we're going to continue to do that. If there is enough demand for an Allsavers design where we don't ship outside of Australia, uh, we will ensure that somebody over there gets access to it, you know, probably in America um, uh, and, and maybe a few other places just so that people aren't missing out. If the, if the demand is there, we will we will try and make that happen for people because ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm never going to make any money out of this, but if I can make people happy, I think that's a really good start. Well, passion is where it starts, right? Yeah, that's it. So, all right. Well, with that said, I think we're getting on a, about an hour now. So uh, mm. I'll say good morning. Good evening. <laughs> and good evening. and uh, I have to go and prepare for uh, machining class. My students should be coming shortly. Oh, cool. So, all right. Well, I was closer. I, I, I joined that because I'm actually trying to learn how to machine things myself um, <laughs> from a, a woodworking background. It's it's not going well yet. <laughs> it's going to take well, some time. <laughs> well, I have some stuff coming down the pipe on, on uh, video tutorials and stuff anyhow. So cool. we'll uh, yeah. <laughs> try to help a few people get there. So, all right. Well, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, have a good evening. Well, have good a, day. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Take care.